Hello students, continuing with the session, uh, module 4. Okay, so in the previous class, uh, in the previous session, we have discussed regarding the uh, different methods of accessing the IVO device, which is the first uh, part in the module 4. Okay, so in the previous class, we have learned that the uh, three mechanisms used for interfacing the IVO devices, or three mechanisms where program controlled uh, um, uh, IVO, uh, next one is the interrupts followed by the DMA, direct memory access, right? So in this session, we will be discussing what uh, do you mean by the interrupts, how the uh, interrupt should be handled and what is the hardware uh, required for the uh, implementation or for uh, um, achieving this particular interrupts. Right. So, in the uh, uh, comparing our methods with that of the program control IO, the in the program control IO, when the processor continuously monitors for the readiness of the IO devices, uh, that means when whether the device is ready to involve in the process of IO transfer or not, uh, this particular uh, processor will be wasting much of the. Uh, uh, computation time. So therefore, in order to resolve this issue, uh, an alternative approach is uh, instead of uh, the processor monitoring for the readiness of the IVO device, the IVO device itself will try to uh, inform the uh, to the processor when the device is ready to take part in the IVO transfer. So that is that mechanism uh, is called as the interrupts. So alternate approach would be for the I.O. device to alert the processor when it becomes ready. So it does so by sending a hardware signal called as the interrupt signal. So now we shall uh, try to learn uh, all the uh, concepts related to the interrupts. So um, or, uh, at least one of the bus control lines called as the interrupt request line is dedicated for this purpose. So processor can perform useful tasks uh, instead of waiting for the IVO device. I repeat. So here what happens in the IVO, uh, in the interrupt mechanism, the processor, uh, the IVO device will try to inform to the processor when the device is ready to take part in the uh, data transfer by sending a special signal called as the interrupt signal via the interrupt uh, line, okay, interrupt request line. So there is a dedicated line to the processor on which the interrupt request from the devices will be sent. So therefore, the processor computation time is being uh, saved using this particular method. So now we shall consider the example uh, by considering two routines here uh, to understand the concept of interrupts. So let us consider the program one for um, there are the program one being executed and we are having called as the interrupt service routine. So now we'll try to let us understand the concept of uh, interrupts here, right. So here in the program one, what happens, we are having the processor is going to sequentially begin the execution at the at uh, this particular line number one and at when the instruction I is being executing by the processor, an interrupt occurs. Okay, so when the interrupt occurs, when the processor receives the interrupt from the IO interrupting device, which is usually the IO devices, so then what happens, the control, okay, so the PC, we call it the program counter uh, and the status register contents are saved on to a, some temporary location, right? The whatever the because you know that the program counter is a register which holds the address of the next instruction. So this PC should be loaded with the uh, address of I plus one. Okay. So therefore, now when the interrupt occurs, the um, processor stops the execution and the it has the processor has to continue with the execution of a new program and a new routine and that is called as the interrupt service routine. Okay, so the routine that is executed upon the receival of interrupts, uh, 
it is called as the interrupt service routine okay so now the this particular interrupt service routine it is located at a different address so now what happens when the interrupt occurs our pc contains because it is pointing to the address of next i plus 1 so pc contains uh, under the status flag it is saved onto the processor stack right and our pc it is newly loaded with the address first uh, address of the isr okay what do we mean by isr interrupt service routine so our pc is loaded with the address of the uh, first uh, instruction where the interrupt service routine so that is loaded into the program counter okay so therefore now our processor continues the execution with the uh, with, uh, with the isr after the execution of the interrupt service routine, after the last execution of the statement, which is our return statement, so when the return is being executed, so then what happens, Our uh, the PC register is restored back. So whatever the contents that were saved, the return address that is I plus 1, that was saved on the processor stack, that will be returned it will be restored back into the program counter okay so this is what how the interrupt and the interrupt service routine will be executed by the processor upon the receival of an interrupt request okay so next to proceed with uh, consider the task why we have to use the concept of interrupts how it is going to save the time Okay, so now let us look at an example. So there are, a consider a task that requires some computation to be performed and the results to be printed on a uh, printer. Okay, so the meaning of that is, so here in the figure we can see there are two routines now. Okay, the example tells that there is a compute routine and the print routine. So the compute routine, what it does, it do the, it does the processing and sends a line of text, a line, uh, one line as an output to the printer routine. So the printer is able to print only one line of data at a time, right? As the information is being given, so now what happens? Each time when this particular compute routine tries to process the data and it is giving. Uh, and when the data is being sent now, it has to, this processor, the processor has to wait for the print routine to print the line of text. So in this case now what happens, there will be, the processor time is said to be wasted. So in order to save the computation time, so we are going to overlap the execution of program 1 with the program 2 that is overlapping the execution of compute routine with that of the print routine. What do you mean by overlapping or uh, how do we uh, overlap the execution that means when the compute routine is printing okay so now um, first the compute routine is allowed to process and uh, um, process and uh, to give the result right. To, it is going to give the uh, result for printing to the print routine. So while the printing, okay, so when once this particular print routine tries to accept the line of text and it is busy, okay, so now what happens if it is printing, uh, when once the data is being printing, uh, this particular uh, print routine when once the job is set to be done it is said to be suspended and then the uh, um, processor will continue with the execution of the compute routine so in this way when one for process is getting executed temporarily another one will be a print routine will be suspended and again when once the device becomes ready so this uh, tries to send the interrupt back to the processor and therefore again this switches from this to this so in this way the, this is called as overlap execution and therefore the transfer of control is can be um, with the use of with the use of this interrupts what happens the computation time can be solved so this program is the example of how the interrupts can be used by the processor
So when a processor receives an interrupt signal, it must be able to branch to the interrupt service uh, routine. So it must also inform the device that it has recognized the uh, interrupt request. So now, how do we require, uh, uh, this can be accomplished in two ways, right? Okay, so some processors have an explicit interrupt acknowledge signal for this purpose. Others, in other cases, the data transfer that takes place between the device and the processor can be used uh, to inform the device. Okay, so now we shall try to, right. So now, before getting into the other details, let us uh, try to understand the difference between the interrupts, uh, interrupt service routine and uh, the subroutine. So first of all, what is interrupt service routine? So interrupt service routine, it is nothing but, as we have seen here, it is the routine that will be executed, okay, it is the routine that will be executed when we have uh, when upon the receival of upon the receival of interrupts okay so the processor execution from the main program it will be suspended temporarily and the processor will try to resume with the new process that is called as the interrupt service routine okay so this what is the difference between this and that of the subroutine so both the uh, so this the table tries to represent few differences between the ISR and the subroutine. So interrupt service routine may not have anything in common with that of the uh, program it interrupts. So both are said to be a different task that is getting executed. So whereas a subroutine, you know that it is a part, it is a linkage of two or more process or program right a subroutine performs a task that is required by a calling program so there is a connection between the calling and the call program so interrupt service routine and the program that it interrupts may belong to the different users and that is the subroutine belong to the same user right so there are other differences also so as we have learned here so before the uh, in the ISR, before the processor needs to switch to ISR interrupt service routine, the processor, uh, the current content of the PC that is called as the program counter needs to be saved onto the processor stack. So whereas here, because it is a straight line execution, so we need not save the contents of the status register. Anyhow, the PC have to point to a different location. Um, okay, so now uh, we shall move on further with the different concepts of the uh, interrupts, right? So saving and restoring the information can be done uh, explicitly can be done automatically by the processor or explicitly by the programming uh, by the program instructions. So saving and restoring the uh, registers as I told you before the data before the processor shifts to the ISR the contents needs to be saved contents of the current uh, the current status of the program uh, which is uh, and the address of the next instruction in the current program needs to be stored um, uh, okay so needs to be stored into some temporary location which is usually the processor stack so therefore now this increases the total execution time and the it tries to in, uh, okay so this increases the total execution time so increases the delay between the time an interrupt request is received and the start of execution of the interrupt service routine so there is a concept of latency interrupt latency trying to introduce so how do we define the interrupt latency it, the, it is the time and uh, from the time between the interrupt request is received and uh, the start of execution of the first instruction of the ISR. So this is called as the interrupt latency. 
Right. So, and uh, what is the need for uh, using this particular interrupt? So, this interrupt, an interrupt is more, it is a mechanism for IO data, for, for uh, the uh, input-output data transfers, for the coordinating the IO transfers. The concept of uh, interrupts is very essential in, and it is widely used in the operating system, real-time processing, Okay, so the concept of interrupts is used in the operating system and in many control applications where processing of certain routines may be accurately time relative to the external events. We, when the processor needs to execute a certain task, so then this particular uh, interrupt concept will uh, is being used. Okay, so now an IO device. Uh, how we are now required to know how the interrupts are being uh, can be handled. So we need an exclusively a uh, hardware setup in order to deal with the interrupt hardware. Uh, in in order to deal with the interrupts, right? So that is uh, uh, we are going to study the concept of interrupt hardware. An IO device which requests an interrupt. Okay. Uh, it is going to request an interrupt. It is going to send a request to the processor okay, by a special line called bus line called as the interrupt request line. So most computers are likely to have several devices that can request an interrupt. So we can see in the figure what is the hardware setup. So this is the hardware setup. So there is a single interrupt request line. So this is our processor. So in within the processor, so this is a designated line. We call it as an interrupt request line, right? So all these are the devices, n number of devices which are connected, okay, via or open switch, okay. So to why uh, to this particular processor, okay. So these are the n number of device one, two, three, and so on. All are connected to the processor. Now, so what is this figure try to tell? An equivalent circuit for an open train bus used to implement a common interrupt request line. So the electronic um, uh, implementation of the circuit can be explained as follows. So what is that? So here there is an open drain uh, gate. This is called as the output of this is usually grounded. Okay, so this is an inactive state. Inactive state uh, when a device which is connected to this, when the device tries to place an interrupt to the processor, so then what happens? The uh, the switch is said to be closed, right? When the switch is said to be closed. The, uh, here, when it is open, it will be in the state 0, right? So, when this, uh, when the device raises an interrupt, it wants to send the interrupt request to the processor. So, then it tries to set, uh, closes the switch and this um, gate, open drain gate will now, it will be in a state 1, okay? So, now what happens? The interrupt request when the switch is said to be closed, the voltage on this interrupt request line drops to zero. So by default, it will be VDD. The voltage at this particular position will be VDD, right? So when the switch is said to be closed, so therefore now what happens when the switch is said to be closed, uh, here the, uh, the gate will enter into the value one, right? Okay. So now when the uh, we are going to take because there is only one common line so this the interrupt request it is uh, it is the or of all we can see here it is the interrupt request it is called it is the or of all the devices okay so we are going to take the logical or of all the interrupt requests coming from the various devices, right? Okay, so now what happens? So because it is, uh, we have to take the complement of the inter signal. Why we have to take the complement? The It is the usual procedure that 
because the voltage when the voltage drops to zero so then this line will be active so that is the reason inter it is a uh, complemented form of inter line we have to take it so this is the hardware arrangement for handling for sending the interrupt request over a single interrupt request line okay so this is called as a single interrupt request so all there are n number of devices connected to this which is here okay so by by default it will be in a state zero and when the device raises an interrupt it this switch will be closed and the, that uh, when it is raised to when the switch is closed the voltage on this line drops to zero and there is another uh, register here this register is called as the open um, register so this particular the role played by this is that it tries to keep the voltage high on this particular line right so this is the hardware that is being used to implement um, it is the uh, hardware uh, that is used okay uh, an IO device request uh, interrupt by activating the bus line called as the interrupt request. So uh, here a single interrupt line may be used to serve n devices in the figure. So just now we have seen this figure. So all the devices are connected to the line via the switches. So that is what we have learned here. Okay. So all the devices are connected to the switch to request and interrupt a device closes its associated switch. So if all the interrupt request signals int R1 to int R N are inactive, if all the switches, when it is inactive, when all the uh, devices, uh, no device has raised an interrupt, okay. So if all the switches are open, the voltage on the interrupt request line will be equal to VDD, okay. So then when one of the device, when any one of the uh, device, IO device, which is connected over the bus, closes its switch, the voltage on the line drops to zero, thereby causing the interrupt request line in tar received by the processor to... So this is the uh, concept behind that particular figure. Since the closing of one or more switches will cause the voltage to drop to zero, Okay, the value of the inter is the logical or of the request from the individual devices. Okay, so the value of inter, okay, totally is this inter signal, it is the logical or of all the devices. We have to use a complement of it, complemented form of inter. Okay, so this is the complemented form. Okay, to name the interrupt request signal on the common line. So, this line is active when for a low voltage state. So, that is the reason why we have to take it as a, um, a complemented form of inter. Okay, so next uh, we are having the concept of enabling and disabling of the interrupts. So why we have to enable and why we have to disable the interrupts? Okay, as we have seen, okay, so next uh, we are having the concept of enabling and disabling of the interrupts. So why we have to enable and why we have to disable the interrupts? Okay, as we have seen here in this particular figure, so when once the device, imagine there are n number of devices, if one of the device has raised an interrupt, second device is also trying to raise an interrupt and third device is also raised an interrupt. So first device has been given the service by the processor, right? So continuously if the other devices are trying to uh, send the interrupt signals to the processor, what happens the processor will be in uh, it is uh, difficult for uh, the processor every time to switch over and execute a different isrs right so therefore in order to avoid this situation so when once the processor is is granted the signal so there what we have to do this particular the requests of other uh, from the other devices should be blocked right temporarily it should be blocked that concept is called as the interrupt disable okay and uh, 
enabling again allowing the other devices to send the interrupt request so that is called as the enabling so now we have to study what are the different ways or the mechanisms in which we can enable and disable an interrupt okay so this concept uh, usually uh, they are going to ask this question uh, explain the different methods of enabling and disabling the interrupts so here we are going to discuss the uh, methods there are three methods here so before going to the different methods so uh, let us analyze what is the need for enabling or disabling the interrupts the arrival of an interrupt request from an external device call, causes the processor to suspend the execution of one program and start the execution of another okay so then what happened because the interrupts can arrive at any time and in any sequence these particular uh, interrupts uh, they are going to alter the sequence of execution of the uh, programs so uh, therefore this is not um, acceptable in certain situations so therefore we have to the need for enabling and disabling the pro the interrupts uh, arises okay so there are many situations in the processor should ignore the interrupt request for example in the case of a print routine compute print program what we have seen earlier an interrupt request from the printer should be accepted only if there are output lines to be printed okay so that means we have to only there was a compute routine okay and there was a print routine so this print routine should send uh, uh, the interrupter to the processor only when there is something to be printed a line of data needs to be printed on to the printer only then this printer should send the interrupt request line otherwise it should not send the interrupt request line okay um, after printing the last line of the set of m line interrupt should be disabled until another set becomes available for printing so this is the use case where the why uh, the need arises for enabling and disabling of the interrupts right so moving further we are having the another general case what are the general cases where why the need arises for uh, uh, enabling or disabling so in another case it may be uh, necessary to guarantee as i have mentioned it a particular sequence of program of instructions is needed to be executed without the interruption okay so when processor is executing some higher priority process the processor usually in that higher priority process which needs to be executed without any interruption so that is the uh, one of the requirement by the processor the isr routine may change some of the data used by the instructions in question right so processors generally provide the ability to enable and disable the interrupts as desired as desired okay so this particular processor it has the ability to enable and disable so now we shall try to uh, look at the different mechanisms in which the uh, interrupts can be enabled and disabled right okay so there are three methods so first we shall look into the first method so the first method tells that first possibility is to have the processor hardware ignore the interrupt request line until the execution of first instruction of the interrupt service routine uh, that has been completed okay so what do we mean by this i repeat first possibility is to have the processor hardware um, ignore okay so ignore the interrupt request line interrupt the until the execution of the first instruction of the isr so what do you mean by the isr it is nothing but our interrupt service routine which needs to be executed whenever uh, the processor okay processor is executing some program it has to suspend the execution and transfer the control to a new program right so first initially what happens the processor will receive the request from the device and the processor will try to service one of the requests 
when one request is being surfaced, it is going to block the other. It is going to see that whatever the signals that are coming on the interrupt request processor hardware, uh, that is the interrupt request line, those lines, uh, interrupts will be blocked on that interrupt request line. Okay. Uh, so that is the first case here. First possibility is to have the processor hardware ignore the interrupt request line. Till what time it is going to ignore? So until first instruction of the interrupt request uh, has been executed. So imagine this is the first instruction of the ISR. Until this execution of the instruction, it will try to ignore. So what is this first instruction of the uh, uh, ISR? We are going to execute the interrupt disable. Okay, interrupt disable signal uh, instruction will be executed as the first instruction in the ISR. So that is called, that is the uh, procedure in the first method of disabling. Okay, I repeat. So in the first process tells that we have to ignore the, uh, the processor hardware ignores the incoming signal over the interrupt hardware till what time it is going to ignore until the processor executes the first instruction of the ISR. What is the first instruction? Interrupt disable is the first instruction that gets executed by the ISR. Naturally, when this instruction is executed, so the processor is not able to take up the request from the other processor. Only when the ISR of this uh, is completed and while returning back, okay, so while the, before the returning, interrupt enable, interrupt enable will be executed. That then what happened, the return statement will be executed which transfers the control back to the processor wherever uh, to the interrupted program okay so this is the first procedure last instruction of an interrupt service routine before the return from the interrupt request line uh, can be interrupt enable okay i repeat first instruction is the disable the interrupt last instruction before uh, returning from the isr will be the interrupt enable enable the interrupt signal okay sorry instruction interrupt enable instruction should be executed followed by a return statement from the isr right so this processor must guarantee that the execution of the return from the interrupt instruction is completed before the interruption can occur right so this is the first procedure of enabling the and disabling the interrupts so coming to the second method, what happens in the second method is that the processor automatically it disables the interrupts before starting the execution of the ISR, interrupt service routine, okay, which is in short called abbreviated as ISR. Okay. So second procedure is that what, what we are going to do, second option is to have the procedure, is to have the processor automatically disable interrupts before starting the execution of the interrupt service routine. So one bit in the what we call this processor status register called the interrupt enable indicates whether the interrupts are enabled or disabled. An interrupt request received while this bit is equal to 1 will be accepted. Okay, so let us look at this particular figure. Right. So here, how does the particular second method can be implemented is that, so you can see here, in yesterday we have discussed that about these all the status flags, right? Okay, status, this is the status register and this is the register, the flags in the control register. So here there is a can bit and this is a then. So what do you mean by this can and then? So which are the flags that are associated in the can and then. So this is nothing but the can is nothing but the keyboard enable and this is the interrupt, uh, sorry, display enable, right? And correspondingly, when these bits are set, the respective devices, when this bit will be set to 1, the status uh, here, the state in this particular status register, the keyboard will try to send, uh, raise an interrupt signal, okay, by setting this flag to 1, I repeat. When this is 1, this also will be made as 1 because 
the uh, interrupt enable and this then the processor will try to enable this particular uh, the, this particular keyboard when the device is ready to send the interrupt signal to the processor this bit will be set to 1 and also this bit will be set to 1 similarly when the device output device is ready so this bit will be set to 1 and then the device output device display device will try to send a interrupt request to the processor right so here what happens uh, in this case two right method two so here what does one bit as we have seen what is the program status register in the pro process status register interrupt enable uh, okay so initially the processor will try to uh, uh, when this bit is set to 1, okay, when initially this bit is set to 1, so the processor will try to grant the request to this, right? So, when once this request is granted, it will clear this bit which was 1, it will reset it to 0 and then it will start executing the ISR. So, when this bit, it was made, First it was 1, it was reset by the processor. Uh, simultaneously, the contents of the PS, that is this particular process, state, uh, process uh, status register will be saved on the stack with the inter, inter, uh, interrupt enable bit equal to 1. The processor clears the interrupt bit in its PS, thus disabling further interrupts, right? Okay, so this is the method 2. I repeat the method 2. What happens in the method 2? Okay, so uh, the processor automatically disables the interrupt. So how it is going to disable the interrupt? So initially when the processor, when the device has set this bit to 1, it will grant the keyboard request. So when other display device, if it again wants to set, initially because this was set to 1, the processor will try to uh, read or provide the uh, service to this particular keyboard by executing its connected ISR. Then what happens, the processor will reset this particular uh, bit to 0. So when this bit is set to 0, automatically it is set to disable the interrupts. Okay. So this is the second method. Right. In the third method of enabling and disabling the interrupts, this third option, the processor has a special interrupt request line for which the interrupt request, uh, interrupt handling circuit responds to only the edge triggered, leading edge of the signal. So, such a signal is said to be edge triggered. Okay. So, the third option is that it depends upon the clock. Uh, uh, it depends upon this particular interrupt handling circuit where it is designed in such a way that it responds only to the leading edge of the signal. Okay, so such a line it is said to be edge triggered. So in this case the processor will receive the request only from one device even though if multiple requests have been sent the other uh, request will be ignored. Okay. So, regardless of how the line is activated, hence there is no danger of multiple interruptions uh, in the case of edge trigger, right? So, this is the method or third method of enabling and disabling of interrupts, okay? So, just a quick review of the um, uh, method one. Here, the processor hardware ignores the interrupt request line and uh, in the second method, we are having the processor automatically it uh, resets the enable bit of the processor register to 0. Okay, previously we, it was set to 1, it will give the service uh, and uh, by saving uh, the contents of a processor register and uh, onto the processor stack, it clears or resets it to 0, thereby disabling the further interrupts, right? So, this is the second method and in the third method, we are having the processor stack, uh, sorry, here in the, um, the interrupt handling circuit, it is going to respond to the edge triggered mechanism, okay. So, this is the way how a different uh, devices can be handled. Uh, this different ways of how to
enable and disable the interrupts, right? So to summarize the whole concept of interrupts here, until now what we have, what is the procedure, general steps of the interrupts? So we are having first a device raises an interrupt signal, the processor uh, interrupts the program that is currently getting executed. Okay, so what is the first step? The device which which requires a service from the interrupt from the processor first the device will send the interrupt request then the second step is that the processor interrupts the program that means it stops currently executing the program what it was currently executing so that is the second step so then the other interrupts are being disabled by changing the control bits in the a processor register okay so then other bits are disabled by changing the control bits in the processor register how to change the control bits so uh, next we are going to look into so device is informed that its request has been recognized by sending an interrupt acknowledgement signal and in response it deactivates the interrupt request line okay so Another point to be noted is that whenever the processor, whenever the processor re request uh, uh, and all the devices, devices which are connected sends a interrupt request, how do the process, how do the I/O device will come to know whether its request is being granted or not? Is that the processor will try to send a inte signal? So what is that inte signal? Nothing but the interrupt acknowledgement, telling, informing the pro, uh, the device that its request has been granted. So that is called as the interrupt acknowledgement. Right, so device is informed that its request has been recognized and in response it deactivates the other interrupt request signals. So action requested by the interrupt is performed by the interrupt service routine. So interrupts are again enabled and the execution of other uh, interrupted program is said to be resumed. Okay, so this is the general procedure of how the interrupts are handled. So now... Uh, we have seen that how, uh, what is the steps involved, what is the hardware setup uh, for handling the interrupts. Okay, so now the question is if there are more than one, uh, uh, several interrupting devices, how the processor can handle the interrupt request from these multiple devices. So that is the concept of handling the multiple devices. So how the multiple interrupts from the multiple devices can be handled. Okay, so several devices may request interrupts at exactly the same time and there can be, there is a single interrupt request line. So how the processor can recognize the device interrupting and uh, how the processor, because several devices are trying to send the request how does the processor rec uh, uh, recognize the device? Okay, uh, given that different devices are likely to require different interrupt service routine, how can the uh, process, uh, uh, processor acquire the starting address of the appropriate program, uh, appropriate routine in each case? Should a device be allowed to interrupt the processor while other uh, device uh, is being serviced okay so should two or more simultaneous requests be handled by the processor so all these questions can be addressed one by one so this uh, concept so it can be understood under the topic handling the multiple devices okay so now what happens when a device is request over the common interrupt request line additional information is needed to recognize which is that interrupting device okay so what is figure 4.6 so here this is the figure 4.6 so this is the hardware setup what we have seen so this figure is called as the 4.6 the hardware single interrupt line right so there is a right so this is the figure 4.6 so what is this one now there is a single interrupt request line so therefore 
this particular right so when a device is received over the when a request is received over a, a common interrupt request line in figure okay additional information is required to identify the particular device whether that uh, de uh, to identify that uh, device that has activated the line that means which device has raised an interrupt okay so further if two devices have activated the line at the same time it must be possible to break the tie okay to resolve the conflict between the two devices okay so when two when the interrupt service routine for the selected device has been completed only then the request for the second can be granted so now handling the multiple requests so this handling the multiple request in here what happens again it is um, the control register so the ken bit and the den bit of the respective devices we know this these bits are these registers are present in the interface circuit of uh, the interface uh, io interface yesterday we have seen that uh, particular in the previous session we have seen uh, the io interfaces in the interface circuit all these registers are present so the which device has raised a interrupt signal so that ken bit will be set to 1 right can and its interrupt request bit will be set to 1 so therefore the processor by looking at the status of these registers it will identify which device has raised a interrupt signal okay so the information uh, okay so that a particular device which has raised a interrupt when the device service routine Uh, that has been completed the second request can be granted and coming to the figure as i have explained so if there are many interrupting devices which device okay so the information needed to determine which device is requesting an interrupt is available in its status register the status register of each device has its irq interrupt request bit which is set to 1 when it requests an interrupt so that is uh, what i have explained so interrupt service routine can pull the devices connected to the bus the isr can look at the status of the status registers okay so then which device has raised the interrupt first which device has set the its interrupt request the q irq bit to one first so that device is given the service first okay so this is the way how to handle the multiple request in one of the ways by polling by allowing the particular uh, uh, interrupt request okay isr routine can poll the ivo devices right so there is a drawback associated with this uh, polling mechanism is easy what is polling i repeat the interrupt service routine is allowed to look at the irq bit and the enable bit what do you mean by irq bit this are the irq bits in the status register it is irq bit what is this irq keyboard interrupt request bit this is display interrupt request bit right so what are these keyboard enable uh, flag and uh, display enable flag so this will be set to 1 and this will be set to one when the device wants to raise a interrupt right so here the interrupt service routine will look at these status registers at the flags of the respective status register so in order to determine which device has raised the interrupt first so which device has set the uh, irq bit for interrupt request bit first will be uh, granted the request first in this way the multi handling of multiple requests will be uh, taking place right okay so a device requesting an interrupt can identify so this the drawback with this mechanism polling mechanism is easy but time consuming see here 
The cooling mechanism is easy, but it is time consuming. Why it is time consuming? Again, uh, it is difficult to query the status bits of all the I.O. devices connected to the bus. Okay, if there are n number of I.O. devices, so uh, the ISR uh, uh, has to look into every routine, every status bits of that uh, device. Okay. So therefore, that method it is uh, it is time consuming. So therefore, next is that uh, concept of vector interrupts is being taken up, right? So what is this uh, vector interrupt? So vector interrupts is nothing but the device here a requesting device will send a code for, to the processor, okay, telling that which code it has to execute. So that is called as the interrupt vector. Okay, we shall understand the concept of interrupt vector in detail. A device requesting an interrupt can get identified itself by sending a special code to the processor over the bus. Okay, so this particular processor, uh, the interrupting device, can, it will send a unique code, okay, usually a 4 to 8 bit code. So that will be sent to the processor, okay. So that this enables the processor to identify the individual devices. Note that each device will be having a unique code. So that code is called as the interrupt vector, okay. So this enables the processor to identify the individual devices even if they share a, in, uh, a common interrupt request line. Okay, so as we have seen in the figure 4.3, even if there is a single interrupt request line over which the n number of devices are uh, connected via a single interrupt request line, if the request, uh, interrupt requests are sent to the processor, by these I.O. devices, okay, so each device will send a unique uh, 4 to 8 bit code, right? So this 4 bit code is used to identify this device, each device. So each 4 bit code will be unique, okay? So depending upon the code which is fixed, so each device will get identified by the processor, right? So this enables the processor to identify the individual devices even if they share a common interrupt request line. The code supplied by the device may represent... Now, uh, now we have to understand what is this code, right? I told you this, each device will send a unique code to the processor to make the processor identify the device. Now the question is, what is this code that the each device will try to send? This code is nothing but the starting address from where the ISR needs to be executed. So what is ISR? Interrupt service routine. For each device, there is a designated ISR which starts at a fixed location. Okay, so that uh, starting address of the first instruction of the ISR so that address is sent as a code. The code supplied to the device may represent the starting address of the interrupt service routine for that device. Okay. So the code length is typically in the range of 4 to 8 bits. This arrangement implies that the interrupt service routine for a given device must always be at the same location. Okay. So what did I uh, hear? So what is the meaning of this one? So each device, each device is having a fixed ISR, right? The location of this ISR is said to be fixed and that of starting address of the ISR will be sent to the processor for the device to get identified. So this particular, okay. So location pointed by the interrupting device is used to store the starting address of the interrupt service routine. So processor reads this address and this address is called as the interrupt vector. So this is called as the interrupt vector.
address where the ISR is going to begin. So that address, that address will be sent as a code and that code we call it as a interrupt vector. Okay. So that code will be used to identify the device which has raised a interrupt and therefore uh, the processor will start executing that uh, the ISR at that particular desired uh, location without any confusion. Right? The IO devices sends the interrupt vector code over the data bus. The interrupting device must wait to put the data on the bus only when the processor is ready to receive. So in this way, the multiple uh, requests can be handled by the processor using the concept of vector interrupts. Right? So when the processor is ready to receive the interrupt vector code, it activates the interrupt acknowledged line called as the intake line. So what we have told you, so here the processor uh, and this is the interrupt request line, intar line, right? So intar line. So apart from the intar line, the processor when it is ready to service the uh, I.O. devices, it will try to send an acknowledgement via a int a line. So that is called as the interrupt acknowledgement line. So the I.O. device responds by sending its interrupt vector line and turning off the interrupt request line. Okay. So this is the general procedure adopted. So now this next is the concept of uh, interrupt nesting. What actually is the interrupt nesting? Okay, so interrupt nesting is a process. So now, uh, for example, now uh, IMO devices. Okay, so interrupt nest uh, nesting. What we uh, what is the concept of interrupt nesting? Uh, why we have uh, what is the requirement for using this interrupt nesting? So before the previously before the processor started executing the interrupt. Uh, uh, service routine, it uh, disables the interrupts from the device. So there are certain cases that uh, interrupt devices, there should be a continuous service by the processor. For example, if we take the process, uh, some application which maintains the time uh, of a day. So in that case, the clock, uh, the process which tries to update the uh, clock needs to be uh, frequently taken up by executed by the processor so that the system time is set to be maintained, right? If the processor do not accept the interrupt request sent by this particular processor, what happens? The uh, There will be, the system time will be hampered. So therefore, there are certain important uh, important uh, prioritized uh, applications or programs which cannot be denied. Okay, it needs the execution or immediately or attention by the processor immediately. So, in order to handle this, we uh, introduce the concept of what we call the interrupt nesting, where the uh, the processor has to execute the instructions and the programs in a prioritized manner. Okay. So, in general, same arrangement is used when multiple devices can send the interrupt request to the processor. During execution of an interrupt service routine or device, the processor does not accept requests from any other device. Since the interrupt routines are usually short, the delay that this causes is generally acceptable. Right? I repeat. So, what happens here? In certain cases, the, pro, the applications... Uh, the delay, when the delay is small, the processor can take up uh, all the processor. Every, uh, the processor will give the chance for every uh, job or program or application to get executed. But when the delay is longer, what happens? The processor, it is difficult for certain uh, devices to get the chance. However, for certain uh, devices, the, this delay may not be acceptable. IO devices are organized in a prioritized structure. Okay. Oh, an interrupt request from a higher priority device is accepted while the processor is executing the interrupt service routine of a low priority device. Okay. So, this concept can be uh, understood with the help of the figure. Okay. 
So this uh, here we are having uh, the concept of interrupt nesting clearly explained with the help of a block diagram. So we are having n number of devices here which are connected via separate interrupt request line. Right? So each device is having its own priority and each device will set, uh, send the request over a designated separate line. Right? So all the requests from the devices will be accepted by the processor and what does the processor try to do? Within the processor there is a priority arbitration circuit. Right? So this priority arbitrary circuit, what does it do? It will try to send the acknowledgement. Okay? It will try to decide the priority of the devices. So when a particular uh, device is getting uh, executed within the processor, when the processor is trying to execute some process, when the device request comes in, the priority arbitration circuit will compare the priority of this device with the current priority of the process uh, or, uh, that is getting executed. Okay, so uh, if the priority is higher, only then the request for that device will be granted, otherwise the priority arbiter will try to see that the processor continues with its execution, right? So this is what the intra implementation of interrupt priority using individual interrupt request and acknowledgement line. So what is the acknowledgement line? So these are the separate acknowledgement lines which are sent to each device. So when the device has raised a request, when through an inter line, okay, so the processor, if it is ready to uh, provide the service to the designated device, it will, the processor will respond by sending an interrupt request line, uh, interrupt acknowledgement line signal, right? So this is called as the interrupt next thing. Okay, so going back. So this the priority. Now we, you can understand what do we mean by the processor. Priority is encoded in a few bits of the process status register. So now we have to understand this uh, the priority. Each now I told the priority. Priority of each device will be stored in, in a particular register or in some particular register. Designated register. Right, each device will be given a priority depending upon the uh, its uh, role. Each device will be given a priority code. Right, so the processor has the ability to change the priority of this particular devices. Right, so how to change the priority of the device? The uh, now uh, the user program cannot disturb the priority of the device only. When the program, when a certain process, okay, when a program, um, operating system application program, it is getting executed in a supervisor mode, right? So there are two modes of executing a program. So usually our OS programs or uh, what we call as the system specific program or our operating system program and application programs, right? So these application programs do not have the right to change the priority of the device. So our operating system routine, when the operating system routines need to be executed, we have, the processor should move from the user mode to the uh, privilege mode, right? So here, uh, uh, sorry, from the user to the supervisor mode. So in the supervisor mode, using a special set of instructions called as the privilege instructions. Okay, so these using this privilege instructions, this privilege instructions have the capacity to modify the priority of the device, right? Depending upon the uh, need, so we can, uh, the processor can alter the priority of the device. So. Uh, this priority can be manipulated by using the privilege instructions in the supervised mode, right? So therefore, now each device when it sends a request, what happens? The, by the processor the, and the priority arbiter will look at the code, 
okay, priority code of each of the device, right? So it will compare with the priority code of the currently executing program. If the priority is more only, it will halt the, it will switch, it will allow the process to stop its execution and switch over to the ISR of a higher priority process, right? So this concept is called as the intra nesting, right? Okay. So, so this concept, a multiple priority scheme can be implemented easily by a separate interrupt request and interrupt acknowledgement lines for each of the device as shown in this particular figure. Okay, I think uh, all of you have followed. Each of the interrupt request lines is assigned a different priority. Interrupt request line is assigned a different priority. Interrupt requests received over this are sent to the priority arbitration circuit in the processor. A request is accepted only if it has a higher priority level than the currently assigned, than the program that is currently assigned to the processor. Okay, so these are the conclusion uh, for this particular diagram, right? Okay. So this, uh, now uh, next is the concept of simultaneous request. So now in the previous case, uh, what is the difference you can observe? Each device is having the capacity to send uh, the particular um, request over separate interrupt request. But in the previous arrangement, we have seen that there is only one designated line. Okay, so in this figure 4.6, you have observed that there is only one designated interrupt, uh, interrupt request line. So if there is one interrupt request line, uh, how do we uh, handle the interrupt request? Okay, so uh, we shall try to stop here. So the concept of how to handle the simultaneous request will be taken up in the next session.